Right lads, before we actually start fishing, let's have a look at the two basic types of poles we might use, use today. First of all is a telescopic pole. As the name suggests, it's telescopic. Basically, it feeds out of the butt, and this is used for swinging fish directly to hand. Now for the beginner, it's not the ideal sort of pole to purchase initially. More often than not, most anglers plumb for a take apart. Take apart is quite simple. Your pole comes in seven or eight different bits. They all fit together like so. So building up your pole, eight, nine, 10, 11, up to 14, 15 meters if need be. Today we'll be concentrating probably up to about 10 meters in length. Now if you go into your local tackle shop, you'll see on the board that this elastic comes in many thicknesses, some very fine, some to very thick. On this particular water, I would expect to be catching fish of four, five, six ounces, right up to two to two and a half pounds. So I'll be using probably a medium heavy elastic and instead of just having it over one section of pole, I'll be having it spread over two sections of pole. So if on the occasion I hook a two, two and a half pound bream, if it feels free to shoot off 10 or 15 foot, no problem. The elastic will just stretch out and the powder elastic will slowly bring the fish back to where I can hopefully net it. These two sections of pole will be fed, to find the right section, into the take apart pole up to a length of around five or six metres. Like so. And what you'll get is you'll have five or six metres of pole. The rig will be using will be tied to five or six metres of line. And then we'll be shipping the pole out. to a length of eight, nine or 10 metres. Rigs, so where do we start? First of all, let's get our line. Today I'm using pound and a half breaking strain line. It's all personal preference. I'm using Bayer today. I know a lot of anglers use Maxima, Kruik or wherever. I found Bayer a very good resilient line. It's a good all round line. And over the years I've used it for 10, 12 years, never had any problems at all. First thing we do is make sure the line has got a nice clean end. There's my blade. That's very important. Because more often than not, you've got a little burr on the end of the line itself. You can never thread the blooming thing through the eye of the float itself. First things first, we thread the line through the top of the pole float itself, through the ring. We then pass the line through a couple of float rubbers. And I'll say two float rubbers, and I'll explain why in a minute. Always wet the base of the float, and you find these silicon float rubbers slide on a lot more easily. Slide the silicon float rubber on, and the second one. Now the first float rubber actually lies right at the base of the float itself. The second float rubber is then slid up just to beneath the body. That then means the line hugs the float all the way down. Find the end of the line again and thread the line through the olivet. Not as often as, not as easy as it seems like so. Now for the difficult bit, let's find ourselves a match. Being a non-smoker, that's a difficult bit. Right. First thing we do, is sharpen the match off to a sharp point. Yep. Make sure so just a quick point, make sure when you thread the olivet itself, you always thread through the thin end first and the line comes out the bottom by the thick end. All olivets are always put on this way, simply because when you actually strike, you want the olivet to cut cleanly through the water. If it's the other way around, you can imagine the fact there's a bulk there, it's a bit of a, a ram force effect against that olivet. This is then plugged with the match, pushed in and then Snap 
snaps off just at the base. And there we go, the Olivet then stays in position on the line and you can slide it wherever you want. That is perfect. That's come out better than it normally comes out. At this stage of the game, we've now got our float and our olivet. The next thing to do is put the hook length on and the drop shots. Now I always use a simple half blood loop on the bottom of the, of the line itself, in other words, half a granny knot, so it forms a loop. Snap the trailing length off, let's put that down in a second. Don't forget lads, wherever you are, take your little bits of line about. Probably hear the birds tweeting in the distance, we don't want to cause any damage to them. I'm not going to put the hook on yet because you can imagine when you're setting these up you don't want the hook catching everywhere. Next thing I'm going to do is put the drop shots itself on. Now this particular float is a 1.5 gram. This Olivet is 1.25 gram. So we'd estimate we want a 0.25 gram drop shot. Now I'm not going to put one drop shot on, I'm going to put two very small styles. Now these are little elongated slotted pieces of lead. They actually clip onto the line by means of using a special set of pliers. We call them style pincers. Now two or three different ways of actually putting these styles onto the line itself. Make sure your styles are, are clean, otherwise you can't quite pick them up. The one method is to actually pinch the style and actually hold it between the pincers and locate it on the line like so. Then just squeeze gently. That style lead is now on the line. Like small shots, they do freely go up and down the line. And because of the design, they don't damage the line. Let's put another one of those on, because I think it will take two or possibly three of those. You notice, very short hook length, six or eight inches. That is then attached to the loop at the base by means of a half blood knot. In those Put the line through, give it a spin, and thread it through on its own loop. Quick pull, trim, and that's a hook in position. Slide and drop shots down. Put my bulk about 10, 12 inches above my hook, and slide the float up accordingly. Now for fine adjustment, you always, oops, for fine adjustment, you amend the floating shot capacity when it's actually rigged up to float itself. But we won't be doing that quite yet. Let's put the rig itself that is now made up to about four metres of line on a winder. Always put the hook first. There we go. Hook onto one of the bars across the winder and progressively wind the rig around like so few turns around there and put it on that little peg you see that little peg at the end Trailing line on the end of the peg, we then have a completed winder, all ready to go. On this particular peg today, because of the pace, and I suspect a few bream in the area, we're going to introduce the majority of the feed in ground bait. The mix is going to be quite simple. Out with the old ground bait tray. The 
the mix I'm going to do today will cover all eventualities. The basic stock item will be a bulking agent, which is secret ground base, secret ground base, which is about a third of the bag. I like to use this super coppers and a tractor. It's fizzing and bubbling around the bottom, quite nice. And a little bit of ordinary breadcrumb. Just mix that round. Right. I'm also going to add a little dash of brazen. Not a great deal, just a quarter of a sachet or something like that. final addition to the mix an additive that to be honest has been with us for years and years and years and I've used it for years and years and years go back to six or seven years ago all we ever used to use was this and standard breadcrumb this is crushed hemp seed without a shadow of a doubt it's a must for roach in England Ireland wherever you go hemp seed is one of the best attractors you can use in a crushed form it gives off lovely oils and attractors all the time. It's a super addition to any ground base, especially if you go to the quarry. Show you a little bit. You see the little cusks and wasp of hemp seed? They all bubble off the bottom and the oil comes seeping out of those. It's super. Right, let's all mix all that in. most important thing to do is never put too much water into any one time. Little and often, that's the object. Dash of water, swish it round, start to get the mix to come together. Well, that's the ground bait mixed up. Final ingredient for the ground bait, of course, is our face. Now, this is always trial and error, believe you, mate. It's a load of fish in your peg. Sometimes it pays for a lot, of, a lot of feeding. But for today, we're pleasure fishing. There's no objection trying to take fish off anybody else. So we're just gonna put a small handful of casters in. And just a pinch of red maggots. That now is ready to start fishing with. Right, before I actually put some feed in, Let's look at the, uh, the tackle layout. Keep net always strategically placed on the left hand side, so if I do happen to start catching quite quickly, drop the fish in, no missing about. I keep all my ground bait and all my hook baits on this little stand at the side of me, that's just for convenience. When I'm fishing the pole and I'm catching, I like to feed left handed, just a matter of handing the ground bait, off we go. Hook baits always at hand. Normally, I use this little thing with a few baits in it, but today, for convenience, as I'm only using maggots on the hook, that's where they're staying. Useful piece of equipment here, the pole rest. All that happens with that is, the pole drops in there. For argument's sake, if you, want to, if, you, if you start catching fish, just legging it on. You don't feel like holding your pole all the time, it gets a little bit heavy. Drop it in the rest, no problem. <clears throat> Landing nest, always on my left hand side. Playing the fish with the right hand, fish comes in, nets unhooks, fish in the net, always return the landing net back to original position. What I tend to do if I am catching very quickly, I always drop the landing net on top of my keep net. Poles, both accessible, from the left hand side and behind me. Anything else? Worms, casters, anything else I need. All I'm trying to say is that once you start fishing you want to be as efficient as possible. First thing to do to locate exactly where you want to throw your bait. Now I intend on fishing between nine and a half and ten meters out from the bank today. So to get a, a guide as to where I should find a depth of about seven foot. Drop the pole on the roller. Not on the roller, sorry on the <clears throat> just set it so it's just off, off the water level. Make up three or four balls of ground bait. Put a few casters in these balls. 
because I'm convinced we're going to catch more bream than roach today. And then, using the end of your pole as a guide, you know where to drop it. One thing, when you are doing this, try to avoid hitting the pole. I've seen people actually break the last six or eight inches of the pole off by just throwing the ground bait in. Let's just get these in, see how we go. Now these are quite hard because it's quite pacey today. So when you go to the bottom, settle and break up slowly. So I've made the balls quite substantial. One. Two. It's a little bit short. Taking an estimated guess at the peg, it's about seven to eight foot. I'm going to run it down once or twice. Just to see if I snag up. Now I could plumb the depth. But the problem with this particular peg is, I get the impression it shallows up towards the end because if I look down the swim, it starts to boil a little bit. So if I plumb the depth in front of me, it's eight or nine foot. And then halfway down my peg, it shallows up to six or seven foot. It's a wasted exercise. Now that hasn't dragged at all yet. Should drag down there because of that wood. Now, let's put another few inches on. It's also notice I'm using a yellow sit float. The reason I'm using that is quite simple. I it picks out the sun when the sun is out. And because I'm fishing opposite those trees, it shows up nicely against the dark background. Let's run it down again. Yeah, that's it. It's dragging under quite seriously there. So I'm going to knock another three or four inches off and I think that is the depth I'm going to concentrate at. The one thing, when that sun goes behind these trees, it goes quite chilly today. You know, so it's in the sun, and once it has moved off, it's going to make it all to bite. That is definitely a bite. Now you can see the elastic. See it pulling out the tip? Now it's only a rose, but it's pulling a good what? 18 inches, two foot. For a real big fish, you wouldn't have to actually move the pole, you just anchor the pole and let the elastic do the work. When the fish starts to tire, then you can start to retrieve the pole. That's quite simple. So matter pushing the pole behind you until you get to the optimum section, which is the section you break at. And then from then on, start bringing the fish in. Now, for netting small fish, it always pays to take one extra section off. And the reason we do that is because when you actually bring the fish in, you have to net them. And if you've got too much elastic and too much pole up, it just makes it that much more difficult. Pole up the river. Not a big fish, but I'm only using, you've got to realise I'm only using the English tackle, I'm only on a 16 or pound and a half. It's a bit of so rope, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's not a bad start to the day. <coughs> First fish anyway. Lovely fish. Look at that. Not a mark on the fins. It's really healthy. Obviously just just come out of the lock on his way to his spawning grounds, I would imagine. Another four or five weeks' time this fish could be really rough after his spawn, but at the moment it's beautiful. Another couple of three roads like this, I'm going to change from the other reef. Because that's when fishing to hand really comes into its own. Saying that, looking at the way the wind's blowing, it might be a little bit difficult with that other reef. Because there's a lot of extra line. Because we're fishing the same distance but with a longer pole and more line.
Japanese they might use. There's obviously a few fish there. I'm going to go over near the pole. I'm going to get this one in. Small roaches. Later in the year, you get these fish really shoal up here. You swing more fish like this. In fact, you would swing fish up to a pound. It's a lot of good things. Try to avoid fishing under trees. But you've got to step your hook lengths up for that. I mean, you've got to start fishing two pound bottoms and, and whatever. So I've got another pole. I'll get the impression of fishing. Yeah. Eight metres of hand rig. Seems to be a few fish there. The only problem is, you do tend to lose a little bit of your presentation on this rig. Whereas the wind's not too bad at the moment, hopefully it'll. It won't be lots of compensate. Well, fishing poles over over eight metres in length, or eight, well, like anything up to fourteen metres, really. I just like to position the pole between the legs and just casually run the float down the peg. No, I've still had a little bit of presentation there because that crease has moved out a little bit further. A little bit lighter than this. Eight meters a hand, two gram floats. Either the fish are not responding to this, or some brain mine moving. Push the roach out. I'll give it another couple of chucks, and then we'll go back to our elastic. Slow it up a little bit more on this run down. No, I don't think this is going to work. Last chuck. If I don't get a fish, I'll go back onto my elastic. Lack of presentation is obviously quite significant on the bottom, and the fish are just not having it unless it's put at them absolutely perfectly. There, bottom. Give it a miss. Let's get back onto that elastic. Ah, that's better. Now we've got one. Ooh, dear. The thing about when you're playing bream on this is that. You just let the elastic do the work. I mean, if that fish is reasonably well hooked, it's just a matter of holding the pole and let the fish actually run backwards and forwards with the elastic itself. It just ties itself out. In actual fact, it ties it itself out quite quickly. When you think the fish is tiring, it's right out there at the moment. It's not ready for the net. Nowhere near. As soon as the elastic starts to creep back, look at that look. Ooh, yeah, really going. The elastic actually creeps back in itself. Yeah, look at that, there's only a couple of foot of elastic now. So you, you then know that the fish is actually starting to tire. <laughs> this is a tricky this when you get his head up. Sometimes if the fish is quite powerful under your feet, and they take a surge for it, you have to put those sections back on again. In actual fact, I'm going to do just this. I might not get many brains, so I might as well make the most of the ones you've got. Just take one section off this time. And then if it's a lock, it'll come to the net. About the right. This one's getting more lively, don't know that. <laughs> Anything else? Come on. That's better than it's gone. Slump. 
problems here with the trees. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, beauty. Of course, this is where most fish are lost. In this. So you just put pressure on the pole, the elastic does all the work, and eventually it'll just come bobbing up to the surface. Number one. Oh, what a lovely fish. It's ever so dark. Look at that, really orange underneath. Smashing fish. A couple of pound. I'll tell you under match conditions, one of these is worth a dozen roach. Beautiful fins. It's not ready for spawning either, yes. It's got none of those little nodules on the top of his nose. See how long it takes to tire itself. This one shan't move the pole. Let's see how long it takes to come to the top. That's when you just know that the elastic's doing its work. Creeping back already. Now it's running again. Not as much pressure on me on this fish, I'll show you. Now he has got some spawning nodules on him. He's on his way up the lock. Nice condition fish. Watch. They're full of them in the forthcoming festivals will go down well. Well that's it. Had a cracking week stay, Northern Ireland. Caught a fair few fish. Got drenched a few times. All in all, very enjoyable. Summarising today, okay, I expected to catch on the eight metre pole to hand. It's just, well, just one of them things. Fishing's unpredictable. Just weren't quite right for that today. The fish just wanted that little bit of extra presentation, and bingo, we caught straight off. Six or seven years ago, the swim feeder really came of age. It's taken anglers at least nine or ten years to get used to using the method. When it was first invented, I don't know exactly how long it was invented, probably 20, 25 years ago, it was a very, very crude method. In fact, the anglers on the River Severn, believe it or not, used to use great big Coca-Cola tins with holes drilled in them, filled with maggots and thrown down the middle. I'm glad to say we've become far more sophisticated than that nowadays. In fact, there are many, many anglers in England that specialise on swim feeder fishing. Also it's been a godsend to the pleasure angler. Fish that were normally inaccessible are now freely caught with a swim feeder. And I can safely say if ever a method had enhanced the sport, the swim feeder's just done that. You go to any local tackle shop. Now, it used to, well, five or six years ago, you used to have a big range of floats, just three or four different types of swim feeders. But nowadays there are dozens and dozens of different manufacturers that manufacture swim feeders, all shapes, sizes, all for specific reasons. 
If I was fishing this particular peg seven or eight years ago, I'd have probably come with one swim feeder. It would have been a simple plastic swim feeder with two caps on the end, and I would just throw this in and hope for the best. But today I've come more prepared. I've got at least seven or eight different swim feeders, and if the wind gets up, I'll change the swim feeder. If it drops, I'll change the swim feeder again. If the, if the flow picks up, just like float fishing, so many combinations. Let's have a look at a few specific swim feeders now. I've got probably a dozen or so in this box. As I mentioned earlier, they're all designed for specific reasons. The swim feeder I'll be using today, let's drop that down. First of all, that is, is a standard open end swim feeder. The makeup is quite simple. It's a plastic tube with a few holes punched into it and a very thin strip of lead down the side. Notice I mentioned lead. Lead is in fact legal, providing it's an integral part of the swim feeder. So don't worry about non-leaded swim feeders. At the end of the lead, you have this little plastic sleeve which we attach the line. And you're thinking to yourself, well, how does he get his bait into that? Well, it's quite simple. We just plug it with ground bait. Ground bait, the bread constituents actually bind themselves into the swim feeder, we then cast it into the lake itself. When it settles on the bottom, fizzes, bubbles, all the bait comes out, fish come in, not only do they eat the bait around your swim feeder, they also take the bait and the hook bait on your hook. The second type of swim feeder we'll be using today is a block end swim feeder. The one end is in fact fixed, but the second end actually comes off, where we actually fill with bait. So in the open end swim feeder, it has some weight down one side. Well, in this particular case, we only fill it with loose feed. In other words, you actually put maggots or casters into the, into the feeder itself. We normally use this, these swim feeders when we're fishing for roach, because I'm of the opinion that the majority of roach would rather feed on hook baits themselves rather than the mess about eating the ground bait. The development of this swim feeder came from that Coca-Cola tin, and all different sizes and shapes of these feeders are now available on the marketplace. In fact, you can get jumbo feeders about three, three and a half inches long, inch, inch and a quarter wide, which probably take an eighth of a pint of maggots. We won't be using one of those today for the simple reason well, we're on our own, there's no need to draw fish from anybody else, so any fish are out there are only going to be ours. You might notice on this particular swim feeder, I've wrapped an extra little bit of lead around the weight itself. In fact, most of the swim feeders I do buy are modified to some extent, simply because every time you go swim feeder fishing, the requirements are slightly different. Now, I wrapped this particular bit of lead around for a match I fished on the River Trent just before the season finished back in, back in uh, March. And the reason being was the weight on the swim feeder itself was just insufficient to actually locate the feeder on the bottom like so. In other words, the current was picking the feeder up and bouncing it along like so. Going back albeit briefly to the, to the open end swim feeder, on a day like today, you'll note that it's, it's quite still at the moment, but at any minute the wind could blow up. Now, for starters, that would be perfect because the weight of the ground bait itself would actually get the feeder down to the bottom and I need very, very little lead to keep it on the bottom. Whereas that wind, hopefully it doesn't, but if that wind did get up, like the block end feeder, I'd have to add extra weight. Not because the venue itself is flowing, but because the surface of the wind and the, and, the and, the, and the lake itself actually starts to push. And the more it pushes, the more pressure that puts on the line. So like the block end, I would have had to put an extra little bit of weight on. We'll wait and see how things develop. Hopefully the weather will stay as it is and we won't have to put extra weight on. Well, as you can see, I've got my gear laid out now. I've set up two rods initially. So let's have a look at exactly what we've set up. Let's start at the business end. hook. Today I'm going to use a size 18, the one, one, point, one pound seven hook length. I'm going to start off with about a three foot hook length, but later in the day we might either shorten that or lengthen it. We'll just see how the fish are feeding. The feeder I'm using is the open-ended swim feeder, and this particular rig is the simplest one you can use. All I've done is tied the swim feeder directly to the end of the main line. About six or seven inches above that, 
So I had a very small half blood knot loop to which I tied my hook length. I must stress here that I always use Maxima for ledgering and the reason is quite simple. It's a very, very good sinking line, especially on waters like this. I'm going to be fishing 30 to 35 yards out today. As you can see, the wind keeps getting up and dropping. There's nothing worse when you're casting and you lay your line on the water, all that line starts to arc because of the wind. What you want to do is get that line under the water straight away. And for, for Maxima, Maxima is brilliant. You just can't beat it for doing just that. Now for the rod and the reel. I'm using an open face reel. This particular model is a Browning 810. It's a nice reel and I do like using it, especially for bigger fish. It's a skirted spool reel, but the beauty of this particular model is that when in fact you do hook a big fish, and being predominantly a match angler, I always lock the base up like so. And once I've locked the base up, I rely on playing fish by either winding backwards or allowing the fish to run freely and pulling the spool around itself. And by actually putting my finger onto this cowling here, I can control the speed that fish is running. In fact, they're ideal for that. Very good make of reel. It's loaded with the three pound Maxima, as I explained. And if you look closely, it's loaded right up to the rim. I'm fishing, as I mentioned, 30 to 40 yards out. Therefore, I don't want the line halfway down the spool before I start, because that does impair my casting ability. Always build the line right up to the lip of the spool, and it casts very, very freely indeed. The rod. Just hook my hook onto that bottom ring. This particular model is a tri-cast 11 foot 4 twin tip. It comes in two sections, and what I do is I keep the spare tips up the butt. Okay, it might rattle a little bit when I'm catching a fish or two, but that doesn't bother me. More often than not, it bothers the anglers around me, so we'll leave them exactly where they are. The business end of the rod in itself is the tip section. This is quite a beefy rod up to there, ideal for punching a feeder a fair distance. But the real business is the tip itself. I very rarely use thick tips because I like to see every, every indication that fish has given me before it actually takes the bait. And therefore I've made one or two special tips for this particular rod. The tips are detachable, I just pull on and off. And depending on the pace of the water itself, I'm going to put either a very fine one or one slightly stiffer. Today, although there's a drift on the surface, the bottom is very still. So I've used a very fine tip and I should be able to see every slight indication. If you look closely, you can see how fine that actually goes. Just a few thou. And you notice on the end of the tip itself, it's painted red. And that is ideal for spotting, especially in conjunction with the target board that I'll be mentioning a bit, little bit later on. That's rig number one. Just drop down there. Rig number two is similar. Terminal tackle is slightly different. Well, it's quite a bit different. It's locked. Oops, get that feeder down to me. Again, I'm using a size 18 hook, the three foot hook length, and a pound and a half breaking strain. This time, I'm using the block end swim feeder. If and when I start to catch a few roach, I'm going to switch to this because <clears throat> I'm convinced this is a better method of catching roach. If you look closely, the feeder in this particular instance is joined to the link by means of an American snap. So if I want to take that swim feeder off and replace it with a bigger one or a smaller one, it's just a matter of depressing the clip and sliding the feeder off. Simple. In fact, I'll be using this just before I actually start fishing when I describe exactly how to plumb the depth. Let's just snap that back on for the time being. As you can see here, the link itself is of two pound breaking strain and is connected to a swivel. The swivel is then connected to your main line, which is free to run through the swivel itself. To prevent that swivel sliding down onto the hook itself, I have a very small number eight stop shot. It's not quite as simple as the other method, but it does have its advantages. 
I've just mentioned I have a two pound link on this and a three pound main line. In other words, I'm going to use that rotten bottom method. If the fish does snag up, or the swim feeder snags up, I would say, that is the first thing that's going to break. Now, normally if I'm pleasure fishing, I'm a little bit reluctant to use a, lose a swim feeder. I'd rather lose the occasional fish. But today, for showing the differences, this is what I'm going to do. The reel I'm using is a DAM CS1, CSI 35. I've always read that as CS1. Again, it's loaded with three pound Maxima. It's a skirted spool reel. And once again, the line is built right up to the top of the spool itself. The rod this time comes in, well, one, two, three, four pieces. There's a detachable butt, which makes it very convenient for transportation. Quite a stiff butt section there. But this time, the tip and the middle section is quite soft. Because I'm fishing for roach, I'm expecting a little bit more sensitive bite indication and a little bit more of a soft action to the rod to prevent me bumping those, that particular species. On the tip itself, once again the tips pull out, but this time, instead of the tip pushing over the tip of the rod, it pushes into the tip of the rod. Again, a very, very fine tip. In fact, this particular tip is a Shakespeare tip that I've modified to push into a DIM rod. Very, very fine, ideal for spotting those very, very small roach bites. I think the start, the thing to do now, is actually mix some bait up. Now the bait I'll be using today will be the normal, maggots, casters, worms and ground bait. But as always, the mixing of the ground bait is very important. So let's get some done. First of all, we'll be using maggots. I won't be using a great deal of maggots. I'll be putting a few of my ground bait mix and I'll be using them on the hook. For some reason the bream over here absolutely adore red maggots. In England we use all colours, oranges, reds, yellows, whites, some reason these are the best over here so that's what we're using. The main ground bait feed we'll be using is of course a caster. This is without shadow of a doubt the best bait for bream. It lies on the bottom, the fish just move onto it and gobble up all they want. Now here's a bait I don't normally bring to Ireland but they do play a major part when you're fishing for bream in fact, any, any swim feeder fishing on still waters in England, the pinky, or more often than not, the squat. Pinkies and squats are very important for the simple reason they enable you to put live bait into your ground bait and fire it at great distances without creating the ground bait to explode in mid-air. If I was to put a ball of ground bait here, for example, full of maggots, the maggots actually moving in that ball of ground bait would actually cause the ground bait to explode before it hit the water. But with these much smaller pinkies and squats, that doesn't happen. As I said, we don't normally bring them to Ireland, but on this particular occasion, as we're describing some English methods, I'm going to pop a few of those in my ground bait as well. Of course, the most important aspect of all your fishing, well, all your bait preparation, is your ground bait. I've always been a little bit meticulous over this, and with feeder fishing, you have to be equally as meticulous. Quite a simple mix today. First ingredient, normal brown crumb. This will make up about 30% of the mix. A few liberal handfuls, which will be catapulting quite a few balls in in a few minutes. Second ingredient, I class this as a binder. It's Vandenine Secret. This gives me a little bit of glueiness in having me to catapult as far as I need to. Although I'm only going 30 yards today, I don't want it shattering in mid-air. So a little bit of secret for today. It's everywhere. A dash of special. Now you don't have to put this in, I just like it. To be honest, I love the smell. A bit of coconut and whatever it is, it's very fine and it, I don't know, it's just a lovely smell. I just like it. I just like using it. It's a bit of confidence there, I don't think it does it any good. I just like using this particular ground bait. Final addition, some of this brasm. Evidently it's designed on the continent for attracting bream. I've always caught a fair few bream over here and I've always used it, so I've got no reason to disbelieve that. But only a few teaspoonfuls of that. Mix it up. And 
have some water. Ideally, the ground that you actually put into the swim feeder needs to be fairly dry. And then when you feed the swim feed actually gets to the bottom, it explodes and leaves the feeder. But you can't catapult dry ground bait very far. So what I normally do is just damp the ground bait initially, so it, although it binds, it's still very, very dry. And I just put two or three handfuls to one side, and that then is ready to use for actually putting in the swim feeder. We weren't using a great deal because the swim feeders aren't that. Aren't, aren't, aren't very big. So just a few cupfuls and that would be ideal to give to go for a couple of hours. Put that over to one side. Now this particular, the rest of the mix needs to be substantially wetter. That will help it to bind and the additional weight will help it carry through the air as far as we want it. Just a sprinkling of maggots. These are samples for the fish just to take. We're probably using maggot predominantly on the hook today, but it doesn't do any harm. Just to put a few in your ground bait. As I mentioned it earlier, too many of those and you just wouldn't be able to catapult your ground bait too far. Secondly, liberal helping of casters. Mix all those in. Put a sprinkling of pinkies in. Not necessary over here, as I brought them with me, it's pointless taking them back. And that now is just about ready to fire out. Just before I actually put it into the, pour it out onto the lake, I'll probably have to damp it down a bit more. So let's get ready and start to prepare the swim. Looking back a few years when we used to fish the lower seven, when there was a lot of fish in the lower seven, we used to fish for bream. We used to put about 30 of these in at the start, put big balls, but we used to throw them by hand. And that was always a secret down there, make them as hard as you possibly can, and wet your hands before you throw them in so they go cleanly to the bottom. Now the Seven's a powerful flowing river, but today there's very little flow out there, and we don't want to create too much disturbance while making the ball of ground bait actually thunder into the water itself. So the ground bait itself is quite a soft makeup. It's just the binding effect on the outer surface will carry it to the distance, and as soon as it hits the water, it'll disappear into a nice puff of ground bait and, and all the bits and the ground bait and the, and the maggots and the castles will sink slowly to the bottom and the bream will move in on it, hopefully. That's four, one more. If this was a competition, and I've got good angles all the way around me, you might find that whoever goes furthest catches most. There's nothing worse than overstretching yourself. For example, I could catapult these, catapult these balls of ground bait 60 yards. If you notice, a little bit of a breeze on it at the moment. There's no way I could get my feeder accurately onto where I put my ground bait. It always pays to put your ground bait a nice, safe, comfortable distance to make sure you, can, you ensure you can drop your swim feeder in that spot all the time. What you normally find is, let's move this out of the way, because we won't be needing that again. Once you put your initial feed into your swim, it normally takes quite a long while for the bream to actually move in. But if we were to catch roach initially, you would soon know when the bream actually moved in because the roach would just move out. It's a quite a boisterous fisher bream. Initially, I'm going to start off with the open feeder rod and the fixed link. And I'm going to load the bait, load, load the hook, sorry, with two red maggots. Let's just cast this. Don't forget, as soon as you cast, sink your line and wait for the feed to get, the, get to the bottom before you actually tighten up. Now the tip has settled back. We've noticed the waves are actually causing the tip just to move a bit. So what I'm going to do is just take up the slack and let the pressure of the tip just pull the tip back. Right, I think it'll be a couple of minutes before we actually get a bite. Let me just explain the setup in front of me here. First of all, two thirds of the way down the rod, I have the rod rest. If you notice, there's a little V in the rod rest, and that is essential when you're ledgering, especially swim feeder fishing. If you try to use a rod rest with a flat bed, the, ro the rod itself lies on the flat bed, and when you want to twitch your swim feeder, you can't, because the line is trapped between the rod and the rod rest itself. That little V on the rod rest enables you 
just to wind on, drag the feeder back, drag it back again, no problem. Also, a little bit further than that, there's the target board. Now, the target board is ideal because when you get those finicky bites, you just line the tip up against one of the lines on the target board and you can see every indication. Yep, gone around that side. Oh, yes. Definitely a bream. Yes. A bit bigger than I thought. This one's not a bad fish. Oh, dear, mate, really going. Look at these rocks here. Woo, taking some line. Come on, my beauty, there he is, he's spin. Oh, you bugger. And I shouldn't swear on camera. Sorry about that. Here we go. Think about brims, you always get the head out of the water before you net them, because that last surge. Beautiful. A few more of these, and have a right good net of fish. What a dark fish that is. Nearly black it is. I tell you what, if you do pegs like this every time, you're going to load them on it. Good fish, this. Right from the back, it's snagged up. See if it swims out. The problem with all these boulders, you see, when you hook a big fish and they come in slow on the bottom, the feeder can catch between. Now, I'm quite lucky on this particular rig. I'll give it a few seconds, hopefully, the fish will swim away and pull that feeder out as a snag. He hasn't yet. Patience. See if he does it. He's still on because the tip's still going. Look at that. Second or so, see if he swims out. Still on, look at that. It's still going around. Come on, swim out of that snake. It's a problem trying to get him up that swimming leg. This is where we all fall in. Remember watching Barry Fulford do this one down the seventh. He hooked a barbel, he ran into a snag, and you could feel it seesawing on the snag, and he did it for 40 minutes. I haven't got the patience to do that. 40 minutes he did it for. And eventually it swam out. He ended up winning the match at 44 pounds. It's a big match as well, an 8,000 pegger. The old BAA annual, and everybody in the country used to say, there we go. Patience is a great thing. <laughs> Right, this was match down, it was the last fish on, on the whistle. And all your Christmas is a bump one. I'm going to let go down again. He thought he was off and away, didn't he? Now, second chance for you, pal. You're in the basket. Oh dear, oh that's a good fish. He's not far off three pound. Still playing with it now. I think they're starting to get a bit finicky. That's a bit ominous out there. I'm going to get wet in a few minutes. Yeah, we're in again. I'm going to make this the last fish. I've got a lot I'm going to pack up before it. Really forward, yeah. Over that ledge. Ooh. Come on. Come on. 
I'm having second thoughts about this thing. I don't think it is a bee. Like scudding along the bottom. Oh, I don't believe it. Perch. I'm not necking him. Come on. Well, that's this. Unusual, really. We've only caught the one perch. Quite a prehistoric looking species. Look at this back fin. It's quite sharp. In fact, when you're fishing over here and you're catching quite a few of these, you can end up hurting your hand quite a lot with their fins actually sticking into you. One thing about perch, when they move into the swim, I'm most certainly most other species have moved out. That's just an ideal end to a perfect day's fishing.